Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Thanks so much for uh, joining us uh, this morning. We're excited to uh, walk you through the campaign canvas. And the key exercise today, I suppose, is to, well, something that we certainly always encourage with our user group members elsewhere, is to participate. So um, we'll walk you through Q&A and a few other bits and pieces, but uh, let me introduce myself and the team to you this morning. So my name is Derek Bell. I'm the Director for Customer Success and Marketing here at Marketing Cube and Matt Hemsley, our marketing manager, and Jason O'Donnell, our account director, also on the line today. And uh, those guys are going to help us with Q&A. So if you do have questions as we move through the session, please utilize the Q&A. Also, please be aware that the Q&A is public. So if you keep an eye on it, if you do see questions that you'd also like to ask, feel free to go ahead and upvote those. Uh, we'll be sure to try and respond to those during the session today. If you do have a question you'd rather not be made public, then please use the chat function uh, to any of the presenters, uh, hosts, and we can answer those for you as well. So first thing to do is outline for you the agenda. What would, would we like to get through today? So we'll do a short introduction, uh, also outline some of the key navigational aspects of the campaign canvas. It may or may not be an area of the canvas that you use on a regular basis. So uh, we just wanna make sure that you're keenly aware as to all of the functional aspects of the canvas. Then we'll jump in and have a look at some of the more common elements that uh, make up the campaign canvas and uh, answer any questions that you might have there. And of course, we won't be able to cover every single element on the canvas, but if there are specific elements that you do have questions about that you're not sure of, please go ahead and uh, again, use the Q&A to, uh, to raise those. Now, if we do have time, we'd like to walk you through some of the release details for release 21B, which is due in the middle of May, uh, depending on which pod you're on. So uh, we've got a few uh, points to highlight there. And then of course, Q&A. But as we said, Q&A is kind of right throughout the entire, uh, entire session. So uh, please again, use that. And we're happy to answer those questions for you. Um, <laughs> something we'd wanted to do uh, is to do a little uh, uh, selfish promotion uh, of Australia. And uh, it's autumn or fall down here in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, this is a shot from our national capital, uh, which is Canberra. And uh, there's beautiful colours that you can see right there. So uh, I think that's the national, yeah, what it is, the National Library, just there on the left-hand side behind those trees. But uh, a great city, if you ever get a chance to visit. One of the first things I wanted to do was, uh, if you have your smartphone with you, um, could I encourage you to scan that QR code that's on your screen right now? Something that's certainly very topical. Our inboxes are being filled and I'm sure your inboxes are probably being filled too by everybody, uh, making us keenly aware that we need to start thinking about the loss of third party data uh, and looking at some strategies and ways to do that. So Matt, who's actually on the line with us today, um, has authored a recent blog post uh, on this topic specifically for Eloqua users. So uh, I'd strongly encourage you to scan that QR code or simply visit our website, marketingcube.com.au and uh, make your way to the blog. And it's the, yeah, it's the most recent blog post that you'll see there. So uh, hopefully you'll get some information or find that helpful. So uh, each month we like to show some attribution, uh, which is just a, a way to emphasize and show, I suppose, uh, how easy it is to capture this information. Um, but also to, to learn from that information as well. So in the course of the campaign that invited you and got you to attend this uh, webinar today, there were actually four invitations. Uh, you'll notice there's only three on the screen there. So it tells me that the third invitation, which was sent to people who, let me just recap, it was sent to people who didn't open the first uh, invitation. So, uh, so yeah, so that shows us that particular one in this instance didn't work Well, didn't convert anybody anyway. But the first invitation was the clear winner. Uh, well, almost the clear winner, I should say, 48% of registrants. Uh, second invitation converted just 2%. And so the second invitation goes to those people who opened the first invitation, but didn't register uh, for the user group. So we picked up a few people through, through that second email. And then the fourth invitation uh, was 44%. So you can see that uh, certainly using some of those elements on the campaign canvas to gauge people's act 
engagement or lack of engagement uh, can certainly make a difference and certainly drives uh, engagement as well. Now, there were a few instances I think we were able to tell where some invitations had been forwarded uh, to other people. And so uh, while we don't have super clarity around that forwarding, we can probably work it out with a little bit of forensics using Insight. But I uh, just wanted to share that information with you. That's just simply extracted directly from form submission data. So one of the key points when it comes to utilizing the campaign canvas as a marketer is the process of doing some thinking and really thinking through that strategy side of things before we actually get to the point of building or in fact launching a campaign. And so the point uh, of this statement on screen is to really think about doing that upfront and doing it early. I'm, I'm certainly a big fan of utilizing the campaign canvas in brainstorming meetings. So I'll often sit with customers um, in a conference room of some sort, usually with Eloqua up on the big screen uh, with the campaign canvas. And it starts out very blank, uh, but then we start to walk through the campaign and start to lay out the flow and the design of that campaign using the campaign canvas. We can then add notes to it, et cetera. We can start to put, think about datelines and you know, how long we're going to wait between different types of communication and what are we going to do if somebody doesn't open it or if they don't submit a form or what if they haven't visited the website, all those sorts of things. So uh, that strategy and that thinking is a really critical part of what you're doing with the campaign canvas. Now, of course, there'll be campaigns that you run where there's very little thinking that needs to be done because they're reasonably repetitious newsletters like we covered last month. Uh, once you sort of get into a routine with a newsletter campaign, they're an excellent candidate to be created as a template to then ensure that continuity uh, from month to month or from week to week, depending on how often you send those newsletters. But the strategy side certainly can't be undervalued. So <laughs> part of the reason we wanted to do this, uh, this topic today was certainly some feedback from customers where they feel a little bit of frustration around not fully understanding every aspect of the canvas and feeling like maybe there are things that they're not doing um, that could in fact uh, be done better. And so I kind of wanted, you know, does this illustration sometimes represent how you might feel <laughs> when you start with your campaign canvas design. So hopefully after today that will change and you might feel like this young lady, sort of super excited, happy, ready to go and uh, pumped in relation to what you're trying to do. So what does that mean? Well, I suppose that means that we need to start thinking a little bit outside the square and, uh, or a marketing cube, we might say outside the cube. You might have recalled from the registration page when you registered for the user group, we uh, took some information from oracle.com and it's the language they use in order to present the functionality of Eloqua. Um, overall, not just the campaign canvas, but really it's the campaign canvas that does the things that you're looking at on screen right now. So it's the notion of dynamic content. It's about trying to create intrigue with your buyers and then adapting the experience based on their engagement or potentially their lack of engagement, but also being able to do that in real time and uh, analyze that and progress people through a journey, uh, not just simply constantly pumping out emails uh, to those particular people. Now, we would suggest to you that that's absolutely doable. Um, the other side of the coin is looking at creating campaigns that adapt. And I suppose if you think about the example I gave just a moment ago for the user group and the way that we communicated with you in order to invite you to register to attend the webinar this month, um, you know, we listened to behavior or lack of behavior and then responded differently. So it's not just the flow and the mechanics of the canvas. So, you know, a big part obviously comes down to your copy um, and the content that you're sharing with people that, that obviously can't be um, underestimated in relation to its importance. And then the final piece that uh, there's certainly emphasize from Oracle's point of view is the speed at which you can deploy campaigns. And there's, that's, you know, it's certainly the case. You can absolutely deploy things extremely quickly, but you'll be in a much better position to deploy things quickly or faster uh, if you're utilizing campaign templates, you know, email templates, form templates, and segment templates, so that you're not necessarily starting from scratch or starting from a blank sheet of paper, so to speak. So uh, thinking about all of those things together, that's part of what we wanted to try and walk you through today. So I think it's important to recap on some of the fundamentals and the basics. And uh, some of the fundamentals are critical in our 
understanding of campaigns so that we can be as effective as possible. When people first enter a campaign as a segment member, and it could be a segment member, or they could be coming in through Facebook or LinkedIn from different ad campaigns you might be running. As soon as they enter the canvas, they become known as a campaign member. Now that campaign member can only enter a single campaign or campaign canvas once. And at some point in that process, they will then exit the campaign. So there's an entry point and there's an exit point. The key thing to, to appreciate with that process is that this helps us ensure that no contact is ever sent the same content twice. So even if you drag up an email from 18 months ago, uh, you don't make any changes to it. You simply take that old email from 18 months ago and you drop it into a campaign and then launch that campaign. If there's somebody in that segment who would have been sent that email 18 months ago, Eloqua will not send that email to that person again. And they'll in fact just stop on the campaign canvas and that will become their exit point. You'll see sometimes you'll get that little number sitting directly above an email. And so that's telling you if you double click on it and open it and have a look, you'll see there'll be a reason or an explanation as to what's going on. And that particular uh, error message is referred to as a brochure resend, which I kind of find it amusing. I'm really unclear why it's a brochure resend. You think it would have been email resend. So uh, yeah, so essentially uh, Eloqua will save your bacon, so to speak, uh, and make sure that that's not, uh, not gonna happen and you're not going to send the same content twice. Important things to remember, campaign members, campaign members enter a campaign, they will exit that campaign at some point, but Eloqua will never send the same content to the same person twice. Okay, so let's jump in and have a look at some of the navigation tips. So this is really just going to give us a nice outline of the campaign canvas. Now this beautiful photograph is taken in Tasmania at a place called Cradle Mountain, which is uh, a mecca for anybody that loves the outdoors. Um, in the winter, we get snow in this environment, but it's absolutely spectacular. If you do ever get a chance to make it to Tasmania, then you should have Cradle Mountain on your bucket list, I would uh, suggest. All right, so as far as the way I look at it, the campaign canvas or multi-step campaigns have four main areas. And so there's the primary navigation that you see at the top of the screen with the file actions, options, say, verify and activate. Then you've got the elements, which is the primary focus of what we'll be looking at today. And they're divided into four subsets as well. So audience, asset, decisions, and actions. And there's also that slide out menu from the right-hand side of the canvas. And so you'll see you can also access campaign settings in there. We can add notes, look at any apps that you might have configured as well. You can also access help and analytics once the campaign is activated. Obviously, if the campaign is not active, there's nothing to report on. Once the campaign is active, though, that's when the analytics will start to flow. And then, of course, the canvas sitting right there in the center of the screen. So let's break that down and have a look at the canvas to get a bit of a clearer idea. <clears throat> so across the top of the screen, as I said, we've got the file actions and options menu. And then on the far right hand side, we've got the save, verify and activate where you actually get things started and, and kick, things, uh, kick things off. On the left hand side is the division of all of the canvas, sorry, the elements that you would drag onto the canvas, also known as campaign steps. On the right hand side uh, is the slide out menu, as I said, and there's a few options available within there. We'll explore each of these in a bit more detail in just a moment. And then of course, in the very center of the screen is the canvas where the magic happens. This is where we start to design the journey, looking at the different experiences that we're trying to deliver to people. But essentially, this is really where the rubber hits the road. And this is where that thinking needs to happen. Sitting down, uh, I bounced some of these ideas off Matt the other day in just thinking through what would be a, a checklist of sorts to help us get our headspace in the right space. And that really comes back to understanding our campaign objective. You know, what is it we're trying to do? If we're just simply putting a segment on canvas and dropping an email on and activating it, we're kind of just having a very MailChimp experience, right? We're not really utilizing the power or the flexibility that you have with a platform like Eloqua. So following on from that objective, then we need to start to think about what's the experience that we want to deliver? What are the outcomes that we're seeking? So that's great that we're going to be sending people emails, but what is the outcome that we want them to do? So how do we make that outcome 
uh, as predictable as possible. Now, of course, again, your content uh, will play a big part in this exercise, um, but we also want to make sure that we can have the experience be as seamless and as elegant as possible uh, in that process as well. And the next one is more about a thinking uh, step again. You know, what do you envisage as the most engaging way to reach your audience? Which kind of flows then into that final bullet point, which is, is it a multi-channel type of campaign that you're running? Uh, is it email plus social or email plus uh, text message or SMS messaging? Is there printed material involved? You know, for example, at the beginning of today's webinar, we presented you with a QR code, not quite quite printed material, still all very digital, um, but a different channel, a different way to get information to people. Um, certainly in Australia, we've become very familiar with QR codes uh, as we have to check in to uh, different venues, restaurants, bars, cafes, etc., uh, from a COVID-19 perspective. And so I think the absolute vast majority of Australians are very familiar now with taking a, their smartphone and scanning a QR code. I assume it's probably quite similar in the United States and Canada as well. You've got magazines, maybe also partners. You might have channel partners that you're working with within your your organizations, whether you're in higher education or in the technology sector or in finance, um, most of us in any of those ecosystems uh, will have business partners of some sort. So is it potential that those business partners could be driving uh, traffic to the campaign? Well, how's that going to happen? How are they going to uh, get people to, uh, to join or participate in the campaign that you're running? So we need to think through all of those processes before we launch our campaign. Let's jump in and have a look at the campaign canvas and the elements themselves and get a bit closer to understanding those. This, uh, this picture is taken in Victoria, which is in the southern part of Australia, uh, still on the main continent, not as far south as Tasmania, uh, in Mount Buffalo, which is the what we call the Snowy Mountain. You may have heard of a movie called The Man from Snow River. And uh, so this part of the world is sort of that high country. Uh, and very shortly, most of this will hopefully be snow capped. So uh, not quite yet, but it's, it's on its way. Okay, so multi-step campaigns. Let's jump in and have a look at what they are and how they function and what we can do with them. What I've done here is um, sort of, you know, here's one I created earlier, so to speak. But essentially what we've got is an arrangement where we can uh, navigate around. So you can see there's we can expand menus, expand them further. The elements are broken down essentially to what are my favorites. So everything you see on the screen are the ones I would use more frequently. And the way I determine that is by adjusting the little gold stars there. So the gold stars represent my favorites. Then across the top, the standard type of menu items that you would select. So new, open, save, save as, save as a template. Um, one thing I'd encourage you to do if you are saving a campaign canvas as a template, don't save, don't take a campaign that's been live and run and has been active. Don't take that and save it as a template because it will be filled with all sorts of configuration. You'll have assets sitting in there, so on and so forth. Uh, a good template from a best practice point of view uh, would be gray, like the one you see in front of us right now, meaning that the, you still need to add the actual assets to it. Um, it's just a little bit too dangerous to be creating templates with old emails attached to it, because at some point someone's going to forget um, and it can make things a little bit messy for you from a campaign point of view. Next menu across is actions. So you've got a verify option here, which is actually the same as verify right here. And what that does essentially, if you watch, if I save this particular campaign, and I'm just gonna call it demo. So once I save the campaign, I get a list of errors and that's what this little number eight is sitting up here. So these are eight things that I need to do. I need to complete before Eloqua will let me activate that particular campaign. Then in actions, if you have approvals um, functioned or turned on on your system, again, you can uh, do that, but approvals won't be available until everything's ready to go. Um, uploading of external activities is something that you do after the campaign has been activated uh, or has concluded. You don't have, you can't obviously do it beforehand. Um, you can copy individual pieces on the canvas. So for instance, if I decided I wanted to multi uh, duplicate this section. I could actually highlight all of those. Now I can use my keyboard shortcut for Command C 
uh, or I can do copy like so, and then come in here and select paste. And you can see I've now created a duplicate uh, of that. So that can certainly be a little bit of a time saver, especially from the point of view, if you're doing things like a nurturing campaign. A nurturing campaign often is quite repetitious in the way that the information is delivered, while obviously the content is unique at each particular step, uh, often the flow of a nurturing campaign is, is repetitious. So it makes it much easier for you to copy and paste uh, as you go through, sort of speeds things up a little bit for you as well. The show all steps, that's what that's doing right there. So I just expanded all of the different steps on the canvas um, and reset favorites. If I reset favorites, it gets rid of everything that I've done. So I won't do that, but, um, but that's how that works. And then options, we have campaign fields, which you can see over here on the right-hand side. And this is where we control how our campaign will start and end. Now, the time zone information that you see here, if you're lucky enough, and some of you are looking on the call, if you're lucky enough to be in the Eastern time zone of the United States, well, that happens to be the default in Eloqua. However, if you're in Chicago or uh, where else would you be? You could be in Vancouver, Los Angeles, you know, Hawaii, different time zones. So th the default that occurs here is actually linked to your user profile. So if you are, for instance, in Los Angeles and you're accessing this information and every time you're having to come in here and modify and change the time zone, have a chat to your Eloqua administrator because they can then update your uh, user profile to reflect your time zone. So that uh, can just save you a little bit of time because that same information flows through on things like wait steps, et cetera. You can see here, again, I've got the default for Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney. So it can make life a little bit easier for you. Then we have the ability to add notes. So um, this is something that I like to use quite a bit. I can click on add note, add relevant comments to that. And then once I've done that, and actually I need to add an asset. Let me just take an asset and you can click on add note. There we go, add some information. And then once you do that and save, that information will appear as a little blue icon that you can see right there. So that then if you're, especially if you're collaborating with people, maybe well, it could be in the same office or it could be in different offices, whether it's across the continent or in other time zones around the world, then that can be a great way for you to collaborate because individuals can come in and they can add information, etc. And if you name these, it makes a lot more sense because you can see here, it's got email 001, etc. instead of just simply saying email. So it makes it a lot easier for people to engage and they can respond and, and uh, share information and insights. So you know, what's the objective of that email? What do we need that email to do? You know, what, what are we trying to achieve with the wait step? How long should that be? All that sort of information. So it saves a lot of email banter and can consolidate that information directly on the canvas, which makes everybody's life a little bit easier. Then from there, if you have any apps uh, functioning, you've got access to those apps then these ones are really, really helpful. So I'm not sure if you use these ones on a regular basis, but as soon as you launch your campaign, the statistics in relation to emails being sent, opens, click-throughs, et cetera, that information actually flows back into Eloqua fairly quickly, like within minutes. However, Insight can take a little bit longer uh, to appear, maybe an hour or a little bit longer or depending on the complexity of the campaign. So the quickest way to get confirmation that after you've launched your campaign that things are actually going out the door and emails are being sent uh, is to look at campaign email statistics. So let me just grab a campaign that is active. Let's have a look. So this is the invitation canvas that uh, that you all received uh, that uh, drove you to be here today. So if I click over here and then look at the email statistics, um, you can see the information contained there. So there's a number of emails that that are four, one, two, and three. And you can see the number of emails sent, delivered, opens, unique opens, etc. Uh, nobody unsubscribes, that's always good news. Unique click-throughs, 
and so on and so forth. So that's the quickest way. And that information pretty much every time, depending on the nature of your campaign, pretty much every time you look at that, those numbers will change. Then the campaign entry report and also the campaign exit report. So these are all the folks that fell into the campaign and you can see how they came into the campaign. And then the other one will be the exit report. Let's just see. Yep, there should be information in the exit report. Yep. So we can see there are a number of people who exited the canvas as well. And that information is captured there. So that one can be really helpful if you're just trying to look at the flow, if you're trying to get a bit of a gauge, because let me just recap that there for you for a minute. You'll notice that. Um, the time and date stamp down the left hand side here. So you can see that pretty much everybody was sent the email at 1031. Now what you're looking at is my local time, 1031 PM, which is not when it was sent in your time zone. It was, I can't figure out what that would have been. I think it was like 8.30 in the morning. But you'll notice as we move to the top of the list, there was additional people that came into the campaign at a later stage. So these are people who, from when I launched the campaign through till today, have actually joined the user group. And so they've become a member of the user group. We've automatically picked up that they've become a member. We've then moved them directly into this campaign. So they then get an invitation to actually join today's session. So um, really helpful report and, uh, and something I look at probably with every single campaign on a, on a fairly regular basis. Then of course you can jump into campaign analysis and once the campaign's up and running, you'll see plenty of data here for insight, but this is probably the fastest way to get an insight report. It's actually directly from the canvas. Um, now, as you know, there are many types of reports available from an insight point of view. And you can see it's a, uh, what did we end up with? 15 or oh, unique click throughs at 8.19% unique print 16%. Uh, that's not too bad. I'd probably like it to be better. Uh, it's not too bad. Um, but thank you, obviously, for joining us and being a part of today's session. So essentially, what we're looking at here is a really quick and easy way uh, to get information. And these are the typical digital marketers expectations uh, of a campaign. So again, you can get all of that information directly from the campaign. So let's go back to the campaign canvas that we were looking at here a moment ago and look at some of the variables here. The most important one is probably right here at the beginning, which is looking at your segment and the entry points to the campaign. I'm just going to delete that. Actually, I'm just going to do a little right click and delete. Just need some screen real estate here. All right, so with campaign members uh, coming into the campaign, there are two ways that that can happen. It can, the first option, which is the default, whenever you drop a segment onto the canvas is to add members once when the campaign is actually first activated. Again, by default, that's the most common outcome. However, if uh, you're wanting to have people added to the campaign on a regular basis because you're actually using filters to create your segment versus perhaps just uploading a list, um, you can always activate this function um, and you do that before you activate the campaign itself. Now, the benefit of that, usually the easiest, easiest example for people is you're running an event and maybe it's a webinar like today or potentially an in-person event and the sales team uh, or other departments give you a list of people they absolutely want to have uh, invited to that particular event. Fantastic, easy enough to do. Upload them into Eloqua. Yep, they're in a segment, that's easy. How many times though have you gone through that process? You've activated the campaign and 15 minutes later, somebody rocks up, let's say it's a salesperson, rocks up with another 50 names. Oh, I can, can we also get these people and you're like, well, I've just activated the campaign. So unless you select that option, your only option is to then deactivate the campaign, add a new segment or add people to the segment and then reactivate the campaign. So utilizing this second option and you can set it to do whichever you want, hours, days, weeks or months. So maybe it's once every you know, two hours or something, if you like. Um, all you would have to do then is say, no problems, thank you, take the list upload that list directly into the segment that's already sitting on the canvas. And within two hours, those people will automatically flow into your campaign without you needing to deactivate the campaign and go through that process. So a much easier way to do things. The Facebook lead ads feeder and also the LinkedIn lead gen form um, 
if you're using these at all today, they're fairly simple to use. Uh, that does require some admin assistance in the back end of Eloqua to authenticate users. So it does mean that you need to uh, have a Facebook account and a LinkedIn account um, to authenticate the user information and then obviously to pay the relevant organizations, Microsoft and Facebook, uh, for the privilege of running those advertisements, but then that information will flow directly into Eloqua. Now, there are some other ones here. Now, these are non-standard uh, applications, and we didn't really want to cover those today just purely from a time point of view. But you can see we've sort of got just about every uh, webinar platform available here. We've got ReadyTalk, Zoom, um, On24, GoToWebinar, uh, all sort of covered there. So they're all, they all do pretty much the same thing, but not the exact same thing, um, but are easily configured. Now, when it comes to emails or assets, there are these options that you have available. Now, one of the key mistakes I see people making, uh, which means that their reporting then just becomes uh, a little bit less uh, robust, I suppose, is missing uh, to put certain information onto a canvas. So let me zoom in here for you for just a second. So when once I actually add the email or associate the email asset with that element on the canvas, um, you'll notice this little icon appears. Now that little icon is telling me that there is a landing page link or a hyperlink in that email to a landing page. So if I double click on that, I'll get a pop-up on the screen like so, and it's the name of the landing page. I can then add that to the canvas. I'll need to zoom out to uh, find it. Yep, here it is. And then you'll notice then that the process actually repeats. Now there's another icon uh, sitting on there. This icon is slightly different. This is a form icon. So again, I can double click on that and add that to the screen. Now, why do I want to do that? The reason I'm doing it, and Eloqua actually tells you right there on the screen in front of you, right, in brackets for reporting only. So what that means, for instance, is if we go back to this example, and this is, uh, you'll see the landing page and form here. When I click on that campaign analysis and have a closer look at that information, there is a value at the bottom of the page that talks about landing page activity. So right there, so landing page, time, landing page, uh, total page views, uh, and total visitors on that information. Now, if I hadn't have put, if I didn't put that information, so the two icons that you see right there, if I didn't have those sitting on the canvas, that would not appear, that, that area would be blank and would be zero. So if I wanted to try and figure that out, I'd then have to extract an additional report for landing pages and then an additional report, so a total of three reports to try and get that information. So it typically makes a lot more sense to, to make sure you have those on screen as you can see, like I have. So if you're in a position where you've got multiple emails sitting on the canvas and you see that little icon sitting next to an email, that should be a red flag, double click, add it to the canvas. And if there's a uh, form associated, add the form as well. It just improves your overall reporting, uh, which can be helpful. All right, let's have a look at some of the decision steps. So the most popular decision steps typically are things like opened email, uh, also potentially clicked email, as you see right here. So clicked, compare contact fields is also really helpful. It can be very helpful, especially if you're in a nurturing campaign or a campaign that runs for a period of time where there's a good chance that while you'll know certain information about an, an individual at the beginning of the campaign, if the objective of the campaign is to in fact offer them information via form submissions, then those each of those interactions would mean hopefully that you're improving the quality of the profile data that you have available. So what I'm able to do there, for instance, is open up the contact and then ask you know, very specific questions. So I might ask the question of a particular contact, is this contact in, let's say for argument's sake, are they in Canada? So I'm going to ask the question, are they in Canada? And it's probably a good idea to make a note here so it's really clear for you as you build out your canvas. Are they in Canada? Well, oops, with a question mark. 
And then I'm either going to have a, a yes or a no outcome as a result of that. There, so really the, the only limitation there is your imagination. You've got access to pretty much every single field uh, that exists on the, the contact. Um, you've even got access to uh, sort of where are we date date created so date fields uh, and date fields can also be interrogated from the point of view or from a dynamic point of view so dynamically on or before etc so if you do have other fields it could be something as simple as a date of birth it could be a contract expiry date um, it could be a range of things but as long as it's actually a date field not just simply a text field that somebody's written a date into so again it must be a date field then we can utilize this level of functionality to actually drive the experience a little bit further. Uh, Steve has a question. How do you use form submission data, um, a form field input to trigger another email in the campaign canvas? Probably the easiest way to do that, Steve, would be to potentially use the add to campaign function um, from the form. I'm hoping that it's heading in the right direction for you. So the Add to campaign function enables you to not only add them to the campaign, but actually nominate exactly where on a campaign canvas that person should be added to following the form submission. Um, depending on what you're wanting to do, as you're probably keenly aware, there are multiple ways to do things. Um, if you wanted to have them continue on a journey, not just get one email, but actually move into a, a new section of a, a campaign, you may choose to create a separate canvas uh, and use the form as the tool to add people potentially to multiple campaigns or to one of many campaigns. So yeah, the add to campaign step on the camp on the form processing step is probably the probably the best answer to that question, I think. If that doesn't quite answer your question or you think maybe that's not quite right, please let me know and uh, we'll have another crack. You've also got the ability to pretty much everything that we described here in relation to accessing the types of data that are available. You can do the same thing from a custom object point of view. So we ran a um, uh, an event here in Australia, New Zealand, uh, some time ago, which was in relation to um, it was a webinar and we, and during the webinar process, we invited people to advise if they preferred red or white wine uh, and if they had a sweet or a savory palate. And so, so that's where we started to get responses to that you can see right here. So this was very campaign specific information. This is not information that we would store on the contact uh, it was very campaign specific. And so we chose to park that onto a custom object. So again, from the campaign canvas, you can use the compare custom object field to again, interrogate that data to drive uh, a contact in one of two directions. The answer being yes or no, essentially uh, to that, that exercise. So uh, I think from memory, I would have chosen a sweet hamper with a white bottle of wine. That would have been my choice. All right, what else have we got over here? Um, a shared list and shared filters are, are very popular as well. So the shared filter, um, or sorry, let me do shared list first. So shared lists are a way for you to group people based potentially on multiple interactions. So you might have, um, so for the user group, I keep using that as an example because it's got so many moving parts, but the, the user group, for instance, we offer you the opportunity to ask a question when you register. And so every month we have a specific shared list where we drop people into if they've asked a question that month, but actually built into our core template for the form that we use each month to register people for the user group, we have another shared list called all time question submitters. And so that enables us potentially to adjust communications to people to say, um, you know, you've never asked a question previously uh, at the point of registration, or we notice you've asked a question previously, anything new, anything else you'd like to ask this sort of month. So this is one example. People like to also do it with white papers. So you might create every time you've got a, a piece of thought leadership or white paper, 
the people have to fill in a form to access, you know, add people to a shared list. Uh, just it takes a second to do, but it then can become very helpful in a whole range of ways because a shared list can be then added to a segment. You can use a shared list here on the campaign canvas to inquire whether or not somebody has done something, for instance. Um, you can also use the campaign canvas to not only check to see if somebody's in a shared list, but you can also add people to shared lists and you can also remove people from shared lists. So again, based on whatever observed behavior that you've got, there are a range. So here they are right here. So a shared list member is, we're asking the question, are they actually in a shared list at the moment? You may then want to do something where you would add people to a shared list or remove them uh, or move them to a shared list. So you've got a range of different types of functions that you've got to play with there. Now a shared filter, um, some people use these all the time, others are not really quite sure what they're, what they're used for. Let me give you the best example. So when we ask this question on the canvas, which is, you know, have they visited the website? What we're actually asking is, have they visited anything on your website, any particular page on your website? The caveat being, of course, that you've got the Eloqua tracking code sitting on your website, which I'm sure most of you would. But um, sometimes that's, that's really helpful at the early stages, especially in a nurturing campaign. You're really just trying to gauge engagement. At that early point, you don't really care what they looked at. Fact is they actually went to the website and, and looked at some content, so that's great. But then as you start to move down further through the campaign and your calls to action may become a little bit more specific, you actually get to a point where you'd like to look at the very specific URLs. So you can use a shared filter to do that. It's pretty much the same interface as building out a segment. You would drag in the visited website, you know, load the relevant URLs uh, from your website. And so then we can ask a very specific question and it could be all of the URLs that relate to a particular topic uh, or product or service that you offer. So shared filters, um, they can be used for a whole range of things. That's just simply one example uh, as to why you might choose to use shared filters. The compare date function is something that I use all the time, uh, especially from a webinar point of view and any type of event uh, campaign that we might be running. Because what compare date enables you to do is to ask the question and relate that question around a date to the point, at the point that a contact actually enters the step. So not at the time that you launch the campaign, but actually um, it's a live question at the very moment that the contact or the individual reaches that particular step. So a good example is you might have an event coming up with four or five emails inviting people at different points. And maybe the third email, your objective is to say, hey, look, we are two weeks out from this event. Now you can only be two weeks out in one very tight 24 hour period. And if you send that email two weeks and one day or uh, one week and six days, um, that's incorrect. It's no longer two weeks, right? Two, two weeks is two weeks and that's all it is. So you have a 24 hour window. So the compare date function uh, would be a way for you to control the flow uh, of that information. And then it'll move people around that email if in fact that two week window has now ended uh, and that information is no longer relevant. So compare date becomes really, really helpful uh, from that point of view. Now, there are other date tools. Now, these are actually apps um, that are added. So date decision, that one enables you to interrogate a date that is sitting on a contact. So an example might be things like a contract expiry date. It could be the date of their first purchase of a product or service from your organization. Um, it could be... Um, uh, the date their contact was created within the platform. A any type of date, you can actually then interrogate. So whether that's on a custom object or on the contact, you can use the date decision to, to interrogate that information. Once we get down to the actions area here at the bottom of the, the platform, they're pretty much broken into a couple of key areas. Now I've got a ton of apps added here. So I'm gonna try and focus just on the, the main eloquent ones. You've got the ability to add, remove, and move people. So when we use the language, say, add to campaign versus move to campaign, 
then you'll notice and actually the elements themselves kind of give it away. So you'll notice that the add to campaign actually has, if I use this as an example, you can see there that I can actually continue through that process. So when I come here, what I'm going to be done, what will happen to me is my contacts will remain in this campaign. Everything will continue, but I'm going to be added to another campaign. The difference with this one now, and you'll see there's no, there's no output at the end. This is a dead end, essentially. So if I was to come over in this direction and I use the move to campaign function, what happens is that becomes the exit point. That's where I end. That's where I finish in this particular campaign. And I'm now moved to a new campaign canvas. Okay, so one will keep me in the campaign. The other one removes me and puts me into another campaign. So add to and move to. The, and the same logic then applies with things like add to shared lists, move to shared lists, um, programs, program builder, et cetera, all exactly the same uh, language uh, for those. Wait step is probably the most common one that most people will use. And you're either going to wait for a period of time or you're going to wait until a specific date and time. Now, for nurturing campaigns that you typically want to have people wait for a period of time uh, or a set amount of time because you've got people coming into that nurturing campaign on a regular schedule. Then, of course, you have to wait until a specific date and time. And that's probably the best example then would really be around um, uh, events and those types of things. Uh, from Joel, is there an easy way to update the Salesforce campaign member status as in not to create a duplicate campaign member. Okay, I'm not sure how you would create a duplicate campaign member. Um, you're referring to this particular function right here. So once the, under the advanced function, depending on how your system has been configured, the CRM campaign ID from Salesforce will pull through automatically and will appear here on the screen. And then once you, open this up, it will then actually load automatically because it's pulling the campaign IDs. There's no campaign ID here at the moment. And then the statuses will appear here. So is there an easy way to update the Salesforce campaign member status as it not create a duplicate campaign member? Joel, I might need you to explain a little bit further because I'm, I'm not sure how it's going to create a a duplicate campaign member. So the campaign member statuses themselves are built in the Salesforce CRM campaign object. And by using the campaign ID, they then simply pull through here, register to attend. Okay, so typically what I would do from that status point of view, and I'm not sure if I did it last month. Now people, I appreciate we've got a little bit over time. So if you do need to go, um, please feel free to leave us. But if you wanted to hang around and ask some questions, happy to stay around for a few more minutes and answer those questions for you. So Joel, let me just see. Okay, here we go. So what I've done here is I've set, or in Salesforce, we've got a campaign member status of registered. And so as people come in from the form, um, we registered them through Zoom. So you would have been registered by us with Zoom. Um, and then, I've set your process or your member status to registered. Now that's not gonna create any duplicates um, because keeping in mind from Eloqua's point of view, you can't have duplicate emails in the campaign anyway. And then the campaign members within Salesforce are or generally should be just a mirror of what's sitting here in Eloqua. Is that answering your question? So you can see there's a whole range of you know, statuses there, but we obviously, uh, want that one to be registered because we know that's where you've come from. Uh, okay, I hear what you're saying. Okay. Okay, so this is not going to create duplicates. That final step that you're talking about. So I can't change your status to attended until I have Zoom um, finish that process off. So you can see here at the very end, we are asking Zoom to check. So everybody's sitting here right now. Um, you'll then go through this process and then Zoom, um, we're going to use the Zoom app to go off and check to see if the people attended or were no-shows, etc. We have found the Zoom app to be 
not as reliable as we would like it to be. And so I've, I'm actually just pushing people into two different uh, wait steps there or exit points. Um, and I'm using the Excel report that comes out of um, Zoom in order to then update Eloqua, we use external activities uh, to do that. But ideally, yes, what you would wanna be able to do is to then repeat that Salesforce campaign association step that you see here and have that sitting in between here, for instance. So if it's a yes, you would change it to attended. Uh, if it was a no, then you would change it maybe to a no-show uh, from that point of view. What we're eagerly waiting on is Eloqua to release or Oracle to release the next version of the Zoom app, which they've told us was due November last year. Um, in a follow-up question I had to the team, with this release, they said they're still waiting on the apps team to confirm a release date. It was really quite interesting. We used this just recently, this very step for the Australian session that we ran this week, uh, and it worked perfectly. <laughs> so, um, but it's just inconsistent. That's the only thing. But that would enable you to then drive that status change for you uh, within Salesforce. Uh, we tend to use external activities as a more robust source of truth for that information, uh, which then flows through into Salesforce as well, into the CRM for the sales team to see. All right, hopefully that answers your question. Now, we would have walked you through a bunch of information around um, some of the updates that are coming. Probably the most uh, interesting one, uh, if I had to pick one or two out of this, would be the spam protection function, uh, which is coming, which will be something that you'll be able to turn on for each individual form. Um, just be aware that if you are using a form and reposting it to your CMS or website, there is some additional coding that you'll need to do uh, on the website to accommodate for that. So please be aware of that. Don't just merrily turn on all of your forms. Uh, if the form is on an eloquent landing page, that's fine. That's easy, turn it on. <clears throat> but if you are reposting to your CMS, please be aware there is some additional coding and there's documentation in the help center to walk you through that as well. If you're an admin uh, on the call today, um, you can now see from a licensing point of view, a breakdown of enabled and disabled users. Uh, you could never do that previously. You had to kind of create folders and things and manually do it yourself. Um, now you can see it right in front of you. So that makes it a lot easier for the administrators. But uh, given we're almost at the bottom of the hour or the bottom of the half hour, yeah, uh, we probably should call it quits. But uh, I look at thank you for hanging around. We've got the staff and Steve and Matthew, thank you for hanging around. Um, if you uh, do have any questions, please reach out to us via email. Uh, and we certainly look forward to visiting with you again next month. Thanks so much for attending, guys. We appreciate your time. <laughs>